A series of rather remarkable results over the last decade, including the latest one just a few days ago, has led to a really nice description of three-dimensional manifolds, a sort one wouldn't even have expected a, maybe a decade ago. So that's what I'll talk about now. This is the virtual classification of three-dimensional manifolds. It's following the work of many people, especially I should highlight Perelman, Jeremy Kahn and Vladimir Markovich, Danny Weiss, Ian Agol and Jason Manning. So the model always in topology is the case we all understand, which is surfaces. So we know what all surfaces are. The first one is the sphere, which, and then we have the torus, and then the surface of genus 2, and so on. We have a series. We also have another series of surfaces which I'll just include because otherwise the surfaces are a little too simple and to serve as a model. We have RP2, we have the Klein bottle and another bunch of non-orientable surfaces. And the remarkable fact, though now very much a classical fact, is that these are all, at least the first row is all the orientable surfaces without boundary that are compact. The second row is the non-orientable ones. Sometimes we want to include the sphere in both series for various reasons. This is our model. We want to get something like this, as close as we can to this. Okay. So now we are going to look at surfaces in various ways and combine all these. Any one of these ways is enough to describe all surfaces, but we'll combine all these to get a description of three manifolds, a virtual description as I said. So firstly there is the notion of a connected sum. Suppose we take a torus and we take another torus and from this we remove a disk and another disk here and then we glue them together so that we just have a circle where we had the disk and here's the torus and another torus we get a surface of genus 2 so the connected sum operation which makes sense in all dimensions is remove disks dn from two different manifolds m1 and m2 and then glue the resulting boundaries. Okay, the boundaries are of course Sn minus 1 in both cases. Now what happens in the case of uh, sphere, you get everything from tori, okay, the orientable ones, just by taking any number of copies. Okay, that's the model we would have to have, every orientable. Uh, surface, here I mean compact without boundary, is T2 connected sum T2 certain number of times. Well, what about the sphere? Well, we should take the sphere as being like 0 or the identity 1 under multiplication. Namely, it's a fact that in general Sn connected sum with Mn, here means n dimensional manifold, is Mn. Okay. So this is easy to see, it's the complement of a ball in a sphere is a ball and we'll say m is prime if it can be written as a product only in this way. If m is m1 connected sum m2 implies that mi is sm for some i. One of them is a sphere. Okay. So just like a prime number can be factored in such a way that one of the terms in the factorization have to be one and there's no other factorization. Okay, so now what about the world of three manifolds? Well, again, because of a classic theorem of Knesser and Milner, any closed orientable, or I'd say oriented three manifold is uniquely a oh, connected sum of prime manifolds. Okay, so M is M1 connected sum, M2, 
etc. connected some Mn. Should I emphasize this is rather special to three manifolds. In some sense, it's not even true to s for surfaces. Uh, at least if you allow non-orientable ones, okay, because RP2 connected some RP2 connected some RP2. I'll just write that down. If I take RP2 connected some with itself three times equals uh, T2 connected some RP2. So it's not true for surfaces, but it's quite remarkably true for three manifolds that there's a unique decomposition into three manifolds. Uh, and so if we really need to study only the prime pieces. We don't need to study how they are put together if we are really interested in just the manifolds. Okay. But now prime three manifolds are in two classes. One of them is S2 cross S1. And the rest of them are what are called irreducible. I won't define this precisely. Now S2 cross S1 is sort of like the torus from this viewpoint so that in the case of surfaces we just had the first case one guy and this whole world of irreducible is what we want to understand now. Okay. So the connected sum we saw in surfaces gives a complete answer but it's a useful guidance here but it's our first step. Now what about our second step? Our second step again we will go by the surface. So there is a different way in which you could treat a surface. If I take a surface, let's take this one of genus 2, okay. then I could break it up along circles and what I would end up with is what I call pairs of planes. Okay. So here is one of them. So here we have a decomposition of the surfaces. So what we are doing here is we break surfaces along simple closed curves, which from our point of view are just embeddings of S1 contained in the surface sigma. And then we get prime pieces. Get uh, what will be called a toroidal pieces. I won't define again what that is, but if we break them as much as we can, we'll get a piece without a toroidal pieces. Now the circle is just a one-dimensional torus. Last time we thought of it as a one-dimensional sphere. Now it's more useful to think of it as a one-dimensional torus. Now it is good to think of the non-orientable case just because again this is too simple. There we get two different kinds of a toroidal pieces. Okay, so what? pieces we get are uh, these pairs of pens, but we also get another kind of piece okay. and that piece is going to be a, a Mobius band. Okay, So this is a guidance. So what we will do with three manifolds is now we will combine the two approaches. Okay, Namely, the we had a prime decomposition okay, and now we have a torus decomposition which says that any uh, irreducible Three manifold can be split along tori into uh, pieces. Now these are not quite atoroidal, but let me just say canonically. So there is a way in which you can define it so that we can cut along tori. So now tori are generalizations of S1. Okay, and instead of getting pairs of pens, you get all sorts of pieces, and so we are reduced to understanding these pieces. Now, describing these pieces is a little bit of a mouthful, so I'm just going to call them pieces from now on. So, pieces are here obtained by two steps. We cut along spheres to get a prime decomposition. And then S2 cross S1 we understand. So the irreducible three manifolds we are again cutting into pieces. This is what we want to understand. Okay. So now how do we understand that? Well, 
It's a very classical result. This is the uniformization theorem. Every surface has a decomposition, has a, sorry, has a spherical Euclidean or a hyperbolic structure, hyperbolic metric. Okay. Now, one subtlety of the torus decomposition is that you have P, uh, not just closed manifolds, but ones with boundary which can be tori. Okay. So we want to talk about those pieces now. Okay. So what happens is, so every surface has a spherical Euclidean or hyperbolic metric. Now this is true for the surface itself, but when it comes to the three manifolds, we don't talk about the three manifolds themselves. Instead, we'll focus on what has happened after the two decompositions earlier. We cut and we uh, cut along spheres to get kind of pri irreducible ones, and then we cut along tori. Okay. So now what do we do in this case? Every surface has a spherical, Euclidean, or hyperbolic metric. So here's the <coughs> Thurston's conjecture. And now this is a theorem of Perelman is every piece that we have has a geometric structure. Now I haven't defined geometric structure because quite remarkably because of the later work which heavily uses Perelman's work certainly but because of the later work one doesn't even need to define it to state the final classification okay so but this geometric structure is of eight different forms so what was missing what was missing is a good description or rather there are good descriptions but a very very nice description of hyperbolic three manifolds. The rest of the geometric ones we understand. Okay. So now let's try to see what kind of description we can have. Well, here we'll have an analog, which is crystallographic groups. These are symmetric groups of spheres. So these are simply gamma contained in isometries of Rm, okay, which is discrete and it's co-compact. That is the quotient is compact. And what do we have here? We have a theorem of Bieberbach. And the theorem of Bieberbach says there exists gamma prime contained in gamma of finite index such that gamma prime is isomorphic to Zn. Okay. So this means that if I look at m which is Rn over gamma prime is a torus. So what does Bieberbach's theorem tells you? It tells you that if you take crystallographic groups, by the way there are 230 of them in dimension 3, okay, far fewer of them are actually free actions, but still there are a bunch of them. You can make tables of them and so on. So you don't get a nice statement about the crystallographic groups themselves, but if you pass to finite cover, you get a beautiful statement. Okay, So that's what we aim for. Virtual, by the way, finite index subgroup corresponds to finite cover. Virtual is up to finite cover or finite index subgroup. So this is what I mean by virtual classification. So virtually how do five, uh, three manifolds look like? Let's look at fibered three manifolds. It's very easy to explain. We have all seen the torus. This is obtained by taking a cylinder and then let's glue the two ends together. Well, you can get the torus. You can also get the Klein bottle if you glue them differently. What about in dimension three? In dimension 3, let's take a surface sigma, cross I. And now let's take a homeomorphism phi, phi from sigma to sigma. Okay, this is our homeomorphism. And then what we'll get is M sigma, uh, which, well, or phi, which is a manifold obtained by gluing. This is a really simple description. 
Okay, and the virtual fibering theorem is every three manifold. Every three manifold has a cover that is fiber. Or I should say finite cover. Okay, so this is a simple, beautiful description. All that it says is that you look at all the three manifolds, you can break them up into pieces in two different ways. First, we'll break them into prime manifolds, then we'll break them along tori into pieces. And each of these pieces is very simple if you're allowed to pass to finite covers. Otherwise, you'll get sort of ugly lists. Uh, which you will work out whenever you can. They can always be done in principle. But in practice, what do you want? You pass to a finite cover, and then you have a very simple description. It says you take a surface cross eye and glue the two ends together using a homeomorphism. Okay. And I should just add that the homeomorphisms themselves can also be described in a beautiful way. Okay. So put these two together, and you get a nice description of three manifolds.